I want to discuss uh, explanatory coherence. Uh, you've done a lot of work on that, and I'm wondering if you could kind of give a brief introduction to what uh, explanatory coherence is to a lay audience, while at the same time, uh, why you think uh, it's uh, what, what are the what are the implications in fields such as AI and psychology? Well, that's a big question, but it's a really interesting one. So let's go back to Darwin. So I mentioned one of my favorite books of all time is The Origin of Species. And so what was he doing in that? Uh, well, in my view, what he was trying to do was to give a coherent explanation of all sorts of things that he observed. So he went on this voyage around the world and he, he collected all sorts of other kinds of biological information. And it gradually seemed to him that it seemed, in fact, that the species had evolved. I mean, now everybody knows that kids get that probably in grade four, but it was a, a, a very controversial idea because some people had maintained it, but it went up against religious doctrines. And so he gradually started to amass more and more evidence that species had evolved. But then from reading a crazy economist named Malthus, he suddenly got the idea of how they evolved. And that's how he came up with the idea of, of, of natural selection. So now we had not only a bunch of observations and the idea that evolution probably had occurred that would explain it, but an idea of how, how evolution had occurred. That is, that natural selection was the mechanism behind evolution. So what he did in that book was an incredibly beautiful argument for his view, as opposed to the view that was dominant at the time, which was divine creation. So what he was trying to show is that his view was a better explanation but than divine creation because it was more coherent with the evidence. Uh, so this is an account that philosophers call inference to the best explanation. You can argue that something is the best explanation because it's more coherent with the evidence. But now you have to say what coherence is. So I had these early ideas coming out of my philosophy of science background. But then in 1987, I got one of the best ideas I've ever had, which was how to turn coherence from a sort of vague philosophical idea into a precise computational one. That is, how can you compute coherence? So I've been working on neural networks in collaboration with my uh, uh, colleague Keith Holyoke, and he came up with an idea that you could use neural networks to explain an analogy. Uh, these neural networks, of course, are now absolutely central to artificial intelligence. It's it's really taken off. That's a whole you know, fascinating topic in itself. Um, but he figured out a way of doing that, and by that time I'd done my master's in computer science, so I was a pretty good programmer, and so I programmed up a program to use neural networks to do analogies. Um, so that that was nice, and then I thought, what else could I apply to? And then I thought back to the problem that was part of my doctoral dissertation, which was inference to the best explanation. How do you pick up the best theory? And so then I realized that that kind of coherence can be understood using the same kind of neural network technique that Keith and I had done for, for analogy. So it was a really powerful method, both computationally, but also psychologically, because there have now since then been lots of psychological experiments that back up this idea of coherence. So I think of the mind, the brain, as essentially a coherence engine. There's some people who think that it's primarily a predictive engine, but I don't think that's true. I think it's primarily a, a coherence engine. We're trying to make sense of things, whether we're making sense of the past, which is what explanations do, or making sense of the future, we're making coherent predictions, or we're trying to identify things. Is, is that a rabbit or a squirrel? Those are, are different kinds of so Everything we do can be understood as having coherence behind it. But coherence now isn't just a sort of vague metaphor that it was for philosophers. It's not just a matter of consistency. It's rather of taking a whole bunch of different things and putting them into a good package. But what's a good package? Well, here there's a, an idea that came out of the um, neural network world called constraint satisfaction. So we're trying to satisfy a bunch of constraints. What constraints did Darwin face? Well, he was trying to explain as much as possible about what he'd seen in the biological world. That's the positive constraints, but he also had a negative constraint. And so he had to show that he could do that better than the theory that was the computer at the time, competitor at the time, which is divine creation. So that's a negative constraint. So what you're doing in all of these things, whether it's decision making or pattern recognition or even emotion, you're putting together different sorts of constraints to evaluate what's the most coherent view. So that's how I came to see coherence, not just as a vague philosophical idea, but as a quite precise computational one that can be used to explain the mechanisms that underlie a vast amount of human thinking.
So that's why I think coherence is really a fundamental idea to psychology and cognitive science and to, and to these philosophical projects as well.